You should all be proud of yourselves. You made it to the last talk, and then there'll be a Q&A after this. But I'll just tell you one story that I think is really fascinating that really um, came out of these kind of patient days. And it started with uh, a, a patient who had transverse myelitis at age 15, okay, who presented to our clinic at some point later in life, and then her sister got the same thing. And that's what really started us down this road. So I don't need to go into the definition of TM. You, you know what this is. But what I want to emphasize with this slide is that this study that we did on the genetics only refers to the patients who have idiopathic TM. We didn't look at NMO or any other patient population except as a control group. This refers to a, a population of patients who have idiopathic transverse myelitis um, for which there was really nothing known genetically. We never really thought of this as a genetic condition. We never told you that anyone in your family was at risk or that we, want, that we even asked you if patients, in, if anybody else in your family had transverse, because we figured no, that there was really nothing out there. So this uh, one woman who first came to our attention was 15 when she had her event, and it was sudden onset. She woke up. She couldn't feel her legs. She started to uh, wobble around. Her bladder became involved. This was at a time before MRI, so the spinal fluid was inflammatory, but I couldn't get the results myself. She, uh, she was convinced that this was transverse myelitis. She said that she responded so well to steroids, and after about two years of rehab, she was back on her legs. And I said, well, okay, that's, that's pretty interesting. What was your um, MRI like when MRI became available? And she sent it to me, and there's a very small lesion down at the bottom of the spinal cord that's not very visible, but probably would show up better on, on the 7 Tesla scanner, for sure, would show up better. And so when her sister, who is now 50, woke up with the exact same thing, she was startled. She was like, oh my gosh, this reminds me of like childhood days when my sister had this, and again, woke up, couldn't feel her legs, was wobbly, bladder involvement. Of course, uh, this happened more recently, so she, she did have an MRI, which I show here, that has that one little dot, a nice discrete lesion right here, which I'd love to see on 7 Tesla. And she also responded well to steroids, but fortunately for her, she came to our attention quickly. We treated her, and she only has a little bit of pain. So her sister is uh, still using a cane, uh, but this, the second woman was not too bad off. But this presented a very interesting opportunity because we I don't think that there were really any ever descriptions of family members, two patients with idiopathic transverse myelitis. So we saw this as an opportunity. They had uh, three healthy siblings and we contacted um, an NIH fund funded group between Baylor College of Medicine where Dr. Greenberg and I went to medical school and Johns Hopkins and got their data, got all of their DNA and their data together, put it through this um, t uh, very complicated computer algorithm that I don't understand. Um, but what, what they spit out was a single genetic mutation that the two sisters shared that was not found in any of their healthy siblings. And what these, these are called chromatograms. They're, they're the sequence of DNA, and what I'm showing here is that normally you should, have, you should have a C here. At this one spot, you should have a C in your genetic code. And our two sisters had an A. That's it. That was all we found, okay? And it turns out that they got that A on both the gene from their mom and the gene from their dad, and one of their siblings had both an A and a C, so they got one from one parent and one from the other. So one of their siblings was a carrier who did not have transverse myelitis. The only two people in this family who had transverse myelitis were the ones that had only the A. And so we kind of rubbed our chin and we looked at the name of this gene, it's called VPS37A, and we didn't really know what to make of it. We thought, okay, maybe one chance family that has this one genetic mutation, what, what can we really learn from this? Well, we, we looked up the gene and we found that this A is present in this configuration where, where you can have just one of them in one in a thousand people. So if there are a thousand people in this room, one of you would have this configuration. 
then you would have to marry someone with the same configuration. And then there's a one in four chance that your child would be born with this. So it's pretty rare. So that would be like about one in four million chance. But that kind of fit the prevalence of TM. So we thought, well, maybe there are more patients with this mutation. So we looked around the world. And around the world, people are getting their DNA sequence, 23andMe, National Geographic, wherever you're doing it, you're getting your DNA sequence and it's being dumped on the web. And, and People, and researchers have access to these things, so we looked them up, right? And we said, how many people in the world have this configuration with the A? We want to know, are there other transverse myelitis patients out there? We found zero, zero human beings walking this earth who have the same thing that our two patients have. But there are quite a few, like I said, about one in a thousand who have that. Um, so the next thing we did is we held a patient day for transverse myelitis at Johns Hopkins. And we also contacted the Accelerated Cure Project. For those of you who don't know, this is a project that collected um, blood and DNA and other samples from patients with transverse myelitis, because we just wanted to know how prevalent was this genetic mutation. Again, we didn't think too much of it, because you know, maybe this is just confined to this one family. But we um, got 86 samples with transverse myelitis and some control groups here. And we found another patient with the exact same configuration and a very similar clinical history. She was 51, she woke up, couldn't feel things, couldn't move well. Um, MRI was done, which showed a, a much more obvious lesion. Uh, let's see if it's, again, I can't see at this angle, but it should be right here where the arrow is pointing. Um, also down here where the arrow is pointing. And she responded, uh, reasonably to uh, steroids have also had some pain. And we put together these family trees with this particular mutation and found, again, those two sisters and then this one patient. Her sister happened to be a carrier. So now we're taking it more seriously. Now we're like, okay, we found the only three people on Earth who have this mutation. They all have transverse myelitis. What are the chances? It turns out the chances are like one in some, you know, 10 trillion. So it's more likely than not that these mutations are contributing to the disease rather than by chance. So what is this gene? I never heard of it before this study. It's called VPS37A, uh, vacuole protein sorting 37A. The original comes from yeast. The A was added for the human form. And all it does is it participates in taking proteins off the membrane of a cell, bringing it into the cell for interrogation to make sure that the protein here is is uh, you know, in good shape. It interrogates it within these um, things called lysosomes and multivesicular bodies and endosomes. And then if the protein is in good shape, it goes right back out to the membrane. If it's in bad shape, it gets degraded and recycled. And this protein is one of 30 that's involved in this process. Uh, I can't see it that well. Is that it right here? Is that it, VPS 37? Yeah. So it's one of about 29 to 30 proteins involved in this process. And if you stain for it, it's pretty much everywhere. This is in the gut. You can find it. It's even found in tumor cells. These are brain tumor cells. So it's kind of everywhere. It doesn't really give us a big clue about how it contributes to transverse myelitis because it seems to be found in every cell. But what's really interesting is that other proteins in this system, those 30 proteins belong to a system called the escort system for vesicle recycling. And there are a lot of other diseases with mutations in this genes. So one of the genes, TSG101, is in the same family as the VPS37A, and a mutation in that gene causes Alzheimer's. And then there are other proteins in these, in these same pathways that cause Parkinson's, ALS or motor neuron disease, frontotemporal dementia, there's one, a different mutation in VPS37A, not the one we found, but a different one that causes a disease called hereditary spastic paraplegia, which is not immune-mediated, but it's also confined to the spinal cord, and it causes a degenerative phenotype. So it's very interesting that all of these diseases that involve these similar proteins have a neurological phenotype, because these, these proteins are found uh, throughout the body. Now, what are the chances that a single genetic mutation can contribute to an autoimmune disease? Turns out, probably not that unusual. 
This list is growing. There are several diseases now that are linked to a single genetic mutation. So I just have a few on here. They're, they're pretty rare, but type 1 diabetes is not rare. Autoimmune thyroiditis, a few others with a single genetic mutation can contribute to the disease. Now, I don't know if this specific mutation will always cause the phenotype. I'm sure there are people out there who have this mutation who don't have the disease, but I need to find them. It just so happens that the people we've captured who have the mutation have all already had the disease. So this is what I, I pitched last year. I asked for people to spit in a tube so I could isolate your DNA and sequence it and see if I could find more patients. And we expanded our search to the rest of the gene as well. So all of these patients I've described so far had that single mutation. What we found now is two, two more, and now I have a third mutation. This slide is, is a little older. Um, here's the gene, VPS37A. There's three different isoforms of it, and uh, these black bars refer to the coding, protein, uh, coding sections of the gene, and they're, they're called exons. And all of the mutations we found so far the original ones were in exon 6. We now found three patients with the exact same mutation in exon 7. We found two patients with mutations in exon 5. And these are all predicted to be harmful mutations, so meaning that if you make that mutation in a mouse, which we're doing now, we expect this to have a harmful phenotype. We can only use computational models to predict whether they'll be harmful or not. You have to come back next year after I make these mice to know if they're really harmful or not. But those are the kind of things that really we gain from um, patient days, because without your contribution, we wouldn't have been able to do any of these uh, studies. And you already met my kids and folks doing the work in the lab. So th thank, you for, uh, thank you for your attention. I think we have a panel now, right?